Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for attending the defense of my PhD. As Pedro said, uh, it was supervised by Dr. Emilio Molina and Professor Emilia Gomez, and I did it in the framework of the Catalan Industrial Doctorates Program. The title is Relative Music Lounge Estimation in TV Broadcast Audio Using Deep Learning. The presentation has the following sections. I will start with the introduction of the motivations behind the thesis, the industrial context surrounding it and its goals. Then I will go through some observations about the scientific background upon which we have built it. After that, I will describe all the work we have done, which is divided in three milestones the development of an annotation tool, the compilation and annotation of data sets, and the creation of computational approaches to the task of relative music, music language estimation. Finally, I will offer a summary of the contributions of the thesis and some ideas for future research on the topic. So this thesis revolves around a new MIR task that we named relative music language estimation and that we defined as a segmentation task that consists of dividing an audio in time intervals of three classes, foreground music, background music, and no music. This task is an extension of the music detection task, where music time intervals are part of divided into time intervals of background or foreground music. Music detection has been a topic of interest in the MIR field for more than a decade now, and has been applied mostly in the context of broadcast audio, focusing especially on the detection of music, even when it is in the background. The reason why we need to extend this task is related to one of the main applications of the music detection algorithms, which is the monitoring of music for copyright management purposes. Two of the main actors in the current copyright management business model are the broadcasters and the copyright management organizations or CMOs. Broadcasters can be, for instance, uh, TV channels or radio stations, and CMOs are the entities that tax these broadcasters based on the percentage of music they use, and then they distribute the collected money among the copyright holders. However, in the case of TV broadcasters, the CMOs consider whether the broadcast music is used in the foreground or the background as one of several relevant factors for the distribution of the copyright royalties. And this is where music detection algorithms fall short, and we need relative music loudness estimation algorithms. Whether the music is in the foreground or the background is very related to the loudness of the music with respect to the loudness of other simultaneous non-music sounds. And this is exactly the definition of relative music loudness. In this thesis, we also use the concept of partial loudness, which is the loudness of a sound in the presence of simultaneous partially masking sounds. We also consider that uh, the partial loudness of a sound is an approximation of its contribution to the total loudness of all the simultaneous sounds. So now that we have established why we need relative music loudness estimation algorithms, I will introduce some details about the industrial context and the company in which I did the PhD. The company is BIMAT, which monitors music worldwide using its own audio fingerprinting technology and then reports the metadata that describes who owns the rights uh, to each identified track to creators, producers, publishers, CMOs, broadcasters, etc. In this context, the task of relative music loudness estimation has four use cases. We use it, of course, to calculate the amount of foreground and background music played in each channel for tax paying purposes. We also use it internally to detect music that BIMAT still does not have in its audio fingerprinting database so that we can incorporate it. Another internal use is to mark parts of the audio with no music so that they don't have to be analyzed by the fingerprint technology, making it more efficient. And finally, uh, we have used it occasionally to analyze the catalog of other companies, for instance, to assess the percentage of non-music content in it. To close the introduction, I'm going to state the two goals that we defined for the thesis. The first one was the development of state-of-the-art computational approaches to the task of relative music loudness estimation, which had to include a production-ready algorithm for BIMIT. And the second one was the introduction and promotion of the relative music loudness estimation task in the research field of MIR. Okay, so let's move on to talk about the scientific background upon which we have worked during this PhD. 
I will limit this section to the description of several observations that we extracted from this scientific background and how these observations affected our decisions on what should be the contributions uh, of this PhD to be met and to the research community. You can refer to the thesis document if you want uh, further details. Before that, though, I have to mention that the task of relative music language estimation didn't exist before this thesis, so there is no specific scientific background, but we found uh, the foundations of this new research topic in several related tasks. These are what we call the music detection related tasks, which include the detection of music as a binary class task, and also a music uh, as a multi-class task that incorporates the detection of a speech and occasionally other types of non-music sounds. We will start with the data sets for music detection related tasks. As we said before, music detection related algorithms are mainly applied uh, to broadcast audio. And that is why most of the data sets created uh, for these tasks contain this type of content. We consider that a data set is adequate for the evaluation of music detection related algorithms in the context of broadcast audio, only if it fulfills at least three conditions. It should include a significant amount of audio files with class changes so that we can evaluate the precision of an algorithm in detecting them. It should contain music both isolated and mixed with non-music sounds. And these non-music sounds should include but not be limited to speech. On top of that, it would be very desirable for the data set to contain a rich variety of scenarios, including different program types and different languages. And of course, the larger the data set, the better. This table shows how the currently uh, available data sets for music detection related tasks fare against the previous conditions. We can see that many of them are quite small. The number of files is not very high either, which compromises the variety of contexts available in them. Not all of them include audio files with class changes, and only one of them includes music mixed with non-music, non-speech sounds, but it does not include and information about the relative loudness of music. This is why we conclude that there is a need for new public datasets that can solve these shortcomings. We consider that these new datasets should include information about the relative music, the relative loudness of music, as it is of course necessary for the relative music loudness estimation task, but it can also be useful uh, for music detection related algorithms during evaluation, especially for error analysis. Regarding the annotation tools, we have found several that could be used to annotate these new data sets, but none of them met the necessary requirements to be useful to BMAT, as we specify in the following section. This is why we decided to create our own tool. Nevertheless, we considered that one of these tools called Audio Annotator, uh, which is a web-based front-end interface of the for the annotation of audio events, had a couple of features that were interesting for our tool to have. Finally, I'm going to mention several observations that we extracted from the reviewed music detection related algorithms. First of all, only a few authors evaluate their algorithms specifically with background music, even though music detection algorithms are mostly applied to scenarios with a significant amount of background music. And those who do, do not obtain very good results. There is a strong lack of reproducible, transparent and comparable evaluations mostly due to the usage of private data. Many authors use unreasonable taxonomy task combinations, such as music speech segmentation, which does not consider the possibility for these two classes to overlap. And we believe this is partly caused by the poor content in the data sets they use, which are not representative of real broadcast audio. We confirm that deep learning techniques have overcome feature engineering approaches and other machine learning techniques also in this research field. And regarding the specific deep learning architectures for music detection related tasks we have reviewed, we see that convolutional neural networks are the most successful type of network, surpassing any type of recurrent neural network. That temporal convolutional networks seem to be promising a promising alternative to recurrent neural networks when trying to model temporal sequences. And another interesting fact is that the concatenation of a CNN frontend with a recurrent neural network seemed to boost the performance of the later producing state-of-the-art results. 
Okay, so at this point, we have seen that we need to create new data sets for music detection related tasks, mainly for two reasons. First, uh, that there is a strong lack of high quality public data sets. And second, that we need data for the development of our own computational approaches to the task of relative music allowance estimation. To annotate this data, we need to create an annotation tool and the resulting tool is called BAT, which comes from BMAT's annotation tool which is the first important contribution of this thesis and the topic of our first publication. And this is the tool that BMAT currently uses to notate everything related to the task of relative music lounge estimation. So we needed to make sure that it was useful to BMAT, but we also wanted it to be a tool that other research teams could use. At BMAT, we actually already had an annotation tool prototype. With this tool, we could label 10 seconds audio excerpts using the classes music, speech, sound effects, and audience. It was very easy and fast to use. It was web-based, which allowed its deployment in a server and facilitated its usage in crowdsourcing and freelance platforms, avoiding any downloads and any installation and configuration processes. And also it was synchronized with our database so that any new annotation or modification was automatically ingested to it and ready to be used for evaluation without the need to generate any external ground truth files. However, the fact that it could only label blocks of 10 seconds of audio was a great limitation when creating a ground truth for training purposes. We needed a tool that could precisely annotate the changes between classes. So we wanted BAT to preserve the strong points of the previous tool and solve its issues. And the first version of BAT uh, allows the annotation of the start and end times of an event, solving the main issue of its predecessor. It allows the overlap of audio events, which makes it appropriate both for segmentation and detection tasks, and also the annotation of their partial loudness, which makes it suitable for the relative music loudness estimation task. It allows for the definition of multiple and independent taxonomies so that it can be used for any segmentation or detection task. It allows for the cross annotation of audio, which is a way to validate the reliability of the annotations that we produce with it. It is open source. It is easy to use and it has a clear annotation environment. It is web-based and easy to deploy in servers as the, previous, as the previous tool. And it includes its own database also, which provides an amenable way to store, manage, and use annotations. So let's see now how we build that and how it looks and works. For the front end of the tool, we combine our own HTML, JavaScript, and CSS code with an audio waveform visualization tool called WaveSurfer.js that was used in the audio annotator tool that we have mentioned before. And for the backend, we use Django and PostgreSQL for the database. This is the annotation interface of BAT. In the middle, we have the waveform of the audio under annotation where we can create events by just clicking and dragging. When we create an event, we need to give it a class, which appears on top of the event. And as you can see, in this case, events overlap. And if that happens, in order to finish the annotation, we need to assign a partial loudness value to all overlapping classes. By clicking the button soft overlaps, we jumped from the event identification phase to the partial loudness annotation phase. We can see this process in this figure. In the event identifi identification phase, we have created two events that overlap, which becomes three regions in the partial loudness annotation phase. The region in the middle has two classes, so we need to assign a partial loudness value to each of them. This value ranges from one to five, and the class or classes with the highest partial loudness always receives a value of five. If a region has only one class, its partial loudness is automatically set to five. We choose to use an annotation method that is relative to the class with higher partial loudness, basically because it prevents inconsistencies due to the volume at which the annotator listens to the audio. We did a small experiment to test specifically the reliability of the partial loudness annotation method. And we did that based on the inter-annotator agreement uh, the idea was that if there is high agreement in the values annotated by several annotators, the method could be considered reliable. We gathered four annotators and told them to annotate 
16 audio excerpts of 30 seconds each that contain 69 regions with classes, but no partial loudness values. We used only the classes music and speech. The results are that in almost 50% of the regions, all four annotators coincided, and this percentage increases to 84% and 100% for three and two coinciding annotators. The agreement average is 83%, which we compute as the sum of the percentage of occurrences weighted by the percentage of coinciding annotators. The impact of this tool has been rather limited outside BIMAT since we presented it in the web audio conference in 2017. But inside BIMAT, it has proven to be very useful and providing annotations for hundreds of hours of audio. Some examples are two datasets that have been essential to this thesis, which we will talk about later. Also, a new dataset of stereo audio, training datasets of algorithms designed for several different tasks, and a few datasets that have been used in one time projects. Let's talk now about these two essential datasets that constitute two very important contributions of this thesis. The first of these two datasets is private to BMAT, and we created it to be the training dataset of BMAT's new rel relative music launch estimation algorithm. The second one is a public dataset that we named OpenBMAT and that we created to answer the need of new public data that we highlight, highlighted before and to foster research in the field. Starting with the private dataset, it contains around 44 hours of audio distributed among 1,322 two minute audio files coming from TV channels and radio stations from all over the world and that were extracted from BMAT's private database. It was annotated by a single annotator with an annotation speed of 5.5 hours of annotation per hour of audio with a taxonomy composed of the classes music, speech, sound effects, and audience, which were inherited from, previous, from the previous annotation tool. The annotations include the partial loudness values uh, of each of these classes, which are later used to derive the relative loudness of the music at each time interval. The mapping conditions are a bit complex, but with some ex exceptions, if the music has the highest partial loudness, it is considered to be in the foreground, and otherwise it is considered to be in the background. We can see that most the most represented classes in the dataset are music and speech, but there is also a significant presence of sound effects and audience. Using these four classes, 85% of the audio files contain class changes in them. And after the mapping to the relative music language estimation classes, the data set becomes quite balanced with 72% of audio files containing class changes. Moving on to OpenBMAT, uh, this data set contains around 27 hours of audio extracted from BMAT's private database and distributed among 1,647 one minute audio files that come from TV channels from France, Germany, Spain, and the United Kingdom, and include eight different program types. OpenBMAT has been cross-annotated by three annotators, which allows for the assessment of the reliability of the resulting annotations, and they annotated using a new taxonomy with the following classes. The music class, which includes only isolated music, and the non-music class, which includes anything that does not contain music, and then several other classes that represent different levels of music loudness relative to simultaneous non-music sounds. Foreground music, uh, similar background music, and low background music. Mixing the presence of music with its relative loudness makes the annotation with this taxonomy a bit faster with 4.75 annotation hours per hour of audio, which is 14% uh, faster than the previous method. And more importantly, it is much easier to map to the relative music loudness estimation and music detection classes, as it already measures relative loudness and not partial loudness. However, with, with it, we are no longer able to distinguish between different types of foreground and background music based on the type of non-music content, which we could do with the old taxonomy. This is how the new mapping works. The non-music class stays always as non-music for both tasks. And for the music detection mapping, the rest of classes becomes music. For the relative music loudness estimation task, music and foreground music becomes foreground music, and the rest becomes background music. 
This table shows the percentage of content for each class after the two mappings. So in the end, there is 15% of foreground music, 35% of background music, and 50% of no music, which translates to 50% of music and 50% of no music with the music detection mapping. The table also shows the percentage of audio files that include class changes for both tasks. Note that even with only the two music detection classes, half of the audio files still include class changes. The way in which we validate the reliability of the annotations is with two metrics that measure the agreement between annotators. A high agreement in the annotations of an audio file means that it has a clear ground truth and that it is safe to use it for training or for testing. These are, there are two types of agreement, full agreement, which happens when all three annotators annotate the same class, and partial agreement, which happens when only two out of the three annotators choose the same class. If no annotator coincides, we say that there is disagreement. So to obtain the full agreement of the entire data set, we need to average the percentage of full agreement of each audio file, and the same applies to the partial agreement. In this table, we show the percentages of full and partial agreement before and after each mapping. Note that partial agreement is almost 100% for any set of classes, while the full agreement increases significantly with every reduction of the number of classes. These agreement values make the data set highly reliable for the tasks of relative music language estimation and music detection. The vertical axis of this table shows the class annotated by two coinciding annotators while the horizontal axis shows the class annotated by the third annotator. This way, the diagonal shows the percentage of full agreement by class, and the table allows us to analyze the main sources of partial agreement. The most common source is for one of the annotators to select an adjacent class in terms of loudness. This affects all classes to a different extent, except for the non-music class. And the second source of partial agreement appears when one of the annotators is unable to detect the music due to its low volume and annotates no music instead of low, low background music. To close the section about the data sets, I will briefly mention the impact that they have had on BIMAT and Academia. The private uh, data set was used to train the current production of relative music language estimation algorithm at BIMAT. And the public one, OpenBIMAT, is the topic of our second paper, which we published in the TISMIR journal. It has already been downloaded 69 unique times. And as far as I know, at least uh, two other authors have used it in their work. So that was everything related to the datasets. And now we jump to the section about the two computational approaches for the task of relative music language estimation that we have developed during the PhD using the these data sets that we described. The first one is the deep music detector, which is the stable production ready technology that BMAT has been using since 2018 to provide the relative music language estimation service to its customers. And the second approach is more experimental. It is based on the usage of partial uh, of temporal convolutional network and also on the usage of a novel deep learning architecture that we named CNN TCN which appends a convolutional neural network front-end to the temporal convolutional network, which is inspired by the usage in the reviewed literature of CNN's in concatenation with recurrent neural networks. So as I just said, the deep music detector is the stable production ready technology that BIMAT uses and comes as a Debian package that contains a binary file compiled from C++ source code and a Python wrapper that simplifies its usage in production. It monitors more than 4,300 TV channels and radio stations 24 seven, and it is able to analyze one hour of, of audio and approximately 20 seconds uh, using a single thread on a CPU. Also, I want to highlight that it was the first technology based on deep learning in this company and that it got first place in the Midex 2018 music detection and relative music launch estimation tasks. The architecture is quite simple and shallow. It includes three 2D convolutional blocks followed by two dense layers and the output layer. The convolutional blocks contain two D convolutional, a 2D convolutional layer and a max pooling layer. And the output layer has two neurons that output 
the partial loudness of the music and non-music content at the input normalized to someone. To transform these two real values into one of the classes of the relative music loudness estimation task, we use two basic thresholds. And during classification, we use a set of heuristic rules to smooth the classes output by the algorithm. The input features of the deep music detector are the log magnitude mass spectrum of the audio. We use mono and a WAP format audio at uh, 8,000 samples per second, and we transform it to the mass spectrum using 128 filters. The output of the uh, deep music detector CNN is independent of the absolute loudness of the audio under analysis. So to prevent the network from, from learning cues related to this, we apply min-max normalization to each input. The final input shape is 128 frequency bins by 128 time frames, which covers a time interval of approximately two seconds. During classification, uh, we do not use any overlap between subsequent input instances, so we obtain a class every two seconds. To create the training ground truth, we need to transform the annotations of the training dataset, which contain overlapping events of music, speech, sound effects, and audience classes and their partial loudness into a vector of length two containing the normalized partial loudness of the music and non-music content in the time interval of the input. To do so, for all the regions that overlap with the time interval at the input, we compute the normalized partial loudness of the music which is the partial loudness of the music divided by the sum of the partial loudness of all the classes that are present. Then we create a ground truth vector for every region and weight each one of them by the proportion of time that they occupy in the time interval at the input. For the evaluation of the deep music detector, we rely on three main metrics, which are balance accuracy and the balance precision and recall of the non-music class. Depending on the use case, we are going to maximize one or another. If our estimations are going to be used to tax broadcasters for the music they play, we have to maximize the non-music recall to minimize the errors where we classify no music as foreground or background music, because this would make broadcasters pay more than what they have to. Another use case is when we internally use the image detector to discard audio for fingerprinting identification. In this case, we want to maximize the non-music precision to avoid missing music that should be identified. And when there is no preference between non-music recall and precision, we just maximize uh, the balance accuracy. There are two places where we have publicly evaluated the deep music detector. The first one is Mirex, where we participated in 2018 and 2019. And the second one is the Open BMAT paper, where we used the music detector to set a baseline for future algorithms and also to run an error analysis. For the task of music detection in 2018, uh, there were five participants and two evaluation datasets, and we obtained the best results in both of them. Then in 2019, we were the only participants, but we presented three algorithms, including the algorithm that we submitted in 2018, a second version of this algorithm and a prototype of the architecture that we will later publish in our third article, which ended up obtaining the best results. For the new task of relative music launch estimation, we were the only participants in both editions of Mirex, and the results obtained were a bit worse than for music detection due to the introduction of the errors between foreground music and background music. And still, um, again, the prototype obtained the best results in 2019. For the evaluation using open BMAT, I believe that uh, the music detector set a good baseline uh, because it was quite demanding, but still leaves room for improvement, especially for the background music class. Okay, so we move on to the more experimental approaches to the task of relative music language estimation. We propose two models, the isolated TCN, temporal convolutional network, and the CNN TCN, which results from adding a CNN front end to the TCN. We opted to use temporal convolutional networks for three reasons. First, because of their capacity to model temporal sequences and take advantage of temporal context, which is a relevant characteristic when working 
uh, with correlated signals like music. This is something that the dim music detector was not designed to do. Uh, second reason is because of their ability to classify at the frame level, which allows to precisely detect class changes instead of outputting a class every two seconds, as the dim music detector does. And finally, because they seem to offer uh, very promising results in the literature. Both TCNs and CN and TCN architectures share the same input features, and these input features are the same that the DMUSE detector uses, except for the number of timeframes. In this case, we use 625 timeframes, which is equivalent to 10 seconds. This is the process that we follow to generate the ground truth to train the proposed models. We first map the original annotations to the relative music loudness estimation tests and classes. Then we split them where they overlap with each other and take the class that is majority. And finally, we merge the contiguous segments of the same class. The TCN reads the input features as 128 temporal sequences of length 625 timeframes. Uh, the architecture is composed of six residual blocks and it outputs the probability of each class at each time frame, which is 16 milliseconds. Each residual block includes two 1D convolutional layers with non causal filters, which have a certain dropout rate and a deletion rate starting at one for the first block and doubling at every subsequent block up to 32. The advantage of using residual blocks is that they learn modifications to the input instead of a complete transformation, uh, which eases their optimization. And they achieve this uh, by adding the output of a function f, which is the result of the input passing through the two 1D convolutional layers of the block back into the input. This way, the output of the function f represents a modification of the input. Here, y is the output of the residual block. An important characteristic of this network is that it does not consider the entire 625 timeframes to compute the output at its time frame but only a portion of it. This portion is called the receptive field and depends on the length of the 1D filters and the dilation rates. And the receptive field can, field can be uh, understood as a temporal context that a network uses to classify a single time frame. And here there is an example of a small TCN with a receptive field of seven time frames. To create the CNN TCN from the TCN, we only need to add the CNN frontend, which is composed of seven convolutional blocks, each containing a 2D convolutional layer followed by a max pooling layer that only reduces the dimensionality in the frequency axis by a factor of two. The output of the CNN frontend is a set of feature maps of shape 1625 which the TCN reads as a set of temporal sequences of length 625 timeframes. And again, outputs the probability of each class at each time frame. So with the CNN frontend, uh, we transform the input features into a new set of features that suit the needs of the temporal convolutional network. Note that this reshaped layer takes care of the frequency dimension that has been reduced to one by the max pooling layers of each convolutional block of the CNN. Classifying at the frame level makes these architectures prone to produce uh, noise in the form of small erroneous segments. That's why both of them benefit from using smoothing strategies. We specifically use a sliding window that assigns the most represented class across all covered timeframes to the central timeframe. In our third publication, we run an experiment with the goal of finding the best TCN and CN and TCN architectures through two grid searches over a set of hyperparameters. We imposed two restrictions. The best TCN must have less parameters than the baselines, and the best CN and TCN must have less parameters than the best TCN. This way, we make sure that any improvement in the results comes from a more efficient use of the parameters and not from an increase of the capacity of the network. For the experiment, we use eight of the 10 predefined splits in the open VMAT dataset for training, and then one for validation and the last one for testing. We used two different versions of the DMUSE detector as baseline, baseline algorithms. 
but we had to adapt them to classification so that we could train them using the open VMAT dataset. But to do so, we only had to replace the two neuron output dense layer by a three neuron output dense layer. The hyperparameters over which uh, we carry out the grid search are the number of filters in the 1D convolutional layers of the TCM, uh, which is M sub TCM, and their length L, the number of filters in the 2D convolutional layers of the CNN, uh, N sub CNN, and the dropout rate DR in all convolutional layers. With the number of filters and the dropout rate, we can play with the capacity of the network, while with the length of the 1D filters, we can adjust its receptive field. The metrics that we use for the evaluation uh, are the balanced accuracy and the balanced precision and recall of each class. We choose to use balanced uh, version of this metric, of the, these metrics, because the data set has much more non music content than foreground music content, for instance. And this would bias the results if we were to use the normal metrics. We also use a metric uh, created by us called ratio of segments, which measures the ratio between the number of segments in the ground truth and the classification. This metric does not measure how correct the classes are, but in combination with the other metrics, we can measure the ability of the algorithm to segment correctly. Note that uh, the optimal value for this metric is one, which means that there is uh, there are the same number of segments in the ground truth than in the classification. Okay, so these are the, this table shows the statistics for the two baselines uh, algorithms and the best models of each architecture. We can see that uh, the best TCN offers uh, better accuracy than the two versions of the deep music detector and also better discrimination between foreground and background music while uh, using fewer parameters. However, even after smoothing, this network creates 54% more segments with respect to the number of ground truth segments. As we will see later, this is due to the creation of short noise-like segments, especially near class changes. The best CN and TCN has the same type of improvements, plus a better detection of background music that was classified as no music by the TCN and the deep music detector. It basically outperforms the best TCN in every aspect, also in the number of generated segments, which is only 14% higher than the number of ground truth segments. And everything while using less parameters, fewer parameters. Here in the plot, we can see how every CNN TCN has a higher accuracy than all TCNs, and also a, a lower ratio of segments. In terms of the ratio of segments, the deep music detector is superior to the TCN and the CNN, CNN TCN models. And in the table below, we have an example of how a CNN TCN outperforms the isolated TCN that uses the same hyperparameters while using fewer parameters. In this last plot, we see the input features in the first row, the output of the CNN frontend in the second row, and in the third row, we have the classification of the best CNN TCN without the smoothing and the ground truth. Note that each combination of music and non music has a different pattern in the CNN output. Also, in the first uh, class change, there is a notation precision error, which the algorithm corrects. And around second eight, we see an example of the noise, noise like short segments that increases the ratio of segments. The conclusions of the experiment are that the usage of TCNs leads uh, to a better performance with less parameters in comparison to the baselines, that all CNN and TCN models outperform all TCN models, even when using less parameters, which proves that the addition of a CNN frontend boosts the performance of the TCN. We also conclude that the addition of a CNN frontend helps in producing smoother classification in comparison to the TCN models. And finally, that the CNN frontend produces consistent patterns that identify different combinations of music and non music sounds. Okay, so this, uh, to finish this presentation, let me summarize these contributions, the contributions of the thesis, and propose some ideas uh, for future research on the topic. 
we have introduced the relative music language estimation task in the MIR research field with the publication of a data set, the development of a state of the art computational approaches, and our participation in the MIREX competition. We have provided a thorough review of the pub published approaches for the music detection related tasks, and we have described the public and, and private data sets available for these tasks and the annotation tools that can be used to annotate them. We have created BAT, an annotation tool that has proven to be functional and useful to BIMAT, provide, providing annotations for hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours of audio, including the cross annotation of open BMAT and the annotation of the training data set of the DMU detected. We have provided BMAT with a private training data set for the task of relative music balance estimation, which comprises uh, approximately 44 hours of audio from TV channels, from from TV channels and radio stations from all over the world. We have provided the research community with a cross annotated public data set for the tasks of relative music language estimation and music detection called OpenBMAT. It contains around 27 hours of audio from several countries and program types with annotations about the presence of music and its relative loudness and covers all the shortcomings of previous data sets. We have provided BMAT with a new relative music language estimation algorithm, the DMUS detector, which is being used in production. We have proposed uh, the CNNTCN, which is a state-of-the-art deep learning computational approach for the task of relative music language estimation, and offers uh, outstanding results in an efficient way in terms of parameters. And finally, we have twice been part of the organization of the MIREX competition as captains, of the tasks of relative music language estimation, music detection, and speech detection in 2018 and 2019. Regarding the next steps in the research on this field, the first idea is to apply the results of our third publication and replace the CNN that currently constitutes the music detector with a CNN TCN architecture. Everything seems to indicate that this change can lead to an improvement of performance, but we need to make sure that the computation time of this new architecture will not represent a setback to put it into production. Also BMAT, at BMAT we have started using recordings in stereo to improve our fingerprinting technology. And we consider that the deep music detector can also benefit from the extra information that stereo audio files provide. As we mentioned before, we already have an outdated dataset containing stereo audio. And actually we have already started with some preliminary experiments Another idea is to create a multimodal version of the deep music detector, including models that can that are specific uh, to channels with a certain type of content. And actually, at this point, uh, we already have a version of the deep music detector for sport channels. The last idea is to use synthetic data to train future versions of the deep music detector. All the data sets that we have used in this PhD contain real data. And this is good because this way we can be sure that the networks that we train are learning to model information that is representative of at least a part of the real broadcast audio. However, the annotations that we can generate uh, for real data are affected by the subjectivity of the annotators and the shortcomings of the annotation method. So the alternative of using synthetic data uh, would allow us to accurately uh, generate different types of ground truths, which would broaden the range of network architectures that we can use for the task of relative news and estimation. So that's everything. With this, I close the presentation. Thank you everyone again for attending. Thanks to the members of the committee. Thanks to my supervisors. And thanks to everyone that has helped me throughout these four years of PhD. Thank you very much. <laughs>